So are we ready? Welcome to Lisbon. <laughs> I'm David Bonderman, and I'm here not in my capacity as chairman of Ryanair, but I am the chairman of Ryanair, the world's favorite low-cost carrier. And this is not what you expected from this, but Ryanair turns out to be a great technological company and one with a sense of humor, which is missing from most tech companies. With that introduction, I'd like to turn it over for starters to Rick Hess from Evolution Media, and we'll move along. Rick? So uh, we, we were hoping for actually a little bit of a turnout. Uh, uh, it's a quite an amazing crowd here. Congratulations to Patty, David, all the founders of Web Summit. This is uh, an extraordinary event. Um, it's my first time. Definitely won't be my last time. And uh, it's amazing, everyone that uh, is here. And we're, we're really happy to be a part of it. So we wanted to do something different and rather have the traditional moderator asking questions. We wanted to mix it up make it more interesting for everyone, we hope, and just create a discussion. It's an extraordinary time to be doing what we do, and uh, we're excited to share that with everyone. Uh, so I would like to start by introducing David Bonderman. It's uh, an incredible privilege of me to be able to call David a friend over the past decade. He's had an extraordinary career uh, all the way from Harvard Law, to the study of Islamic law. He actually is fluent in Arabic. There's so many things about David Bonderman you uh, would be fascinated by. He is a pioneer of private equity uh, and a legendary investor. He talked about Ryanair. Uh, he was uh, the original owner of, Con of Continental Airlines, which was a, a famous story that kind of launched this moment in private equity investing over the past couple decades. What's most interesting about David beyond his track record is he sets himself apart from all the other private equity investors I've had the uh, benefit of meeting. He has an incredible humility, an insatiable curiosity. Hey, hey Rick, Rick, my mother's not in the audience. I'm, we can stop this. <laughs> I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping. I've, I've been waiting for this moment for 10 years to talk about David. He uh, is fascinated by people, and he has a desire to learn, which sets him apart in an incredible industry. He manages over $70 billion. He's invested tens of billions of dollars, yet he's here today not because of those large cap companies we talked about, but because of his fascination in the future and in media and technology. He's uh, one of the early investors in Uber, Airbnb, Spotify, and he also is my partner. So I'm incredibly proud to be up here and to introduce everyone to David Bonderman. All right, so, so if this is mom or dad, this is mom on the other side from an iFlix perspective, because iFlix is a, is a love child originally from TPG growth and an organization you may not heard of called Evolution Media. Um, Evolution Media is a partnership between TPG and a group called Creative Artist Agency, CAA. If anyone's seen the show Entourage, that moment <laughs> where all the super agents sort of throw things at each other across the office. That's been Rick's life for, for almost 20 years. Uh, film producer, member of the Film Academy, and is now an investor in technology, media, and the disruption, which is bringing all that together. And iFlix has been the birth of that experience. And just a word about Mark. Uh, Mark is an Aussie, as you can probably tell <laughs> from listening to him. Uh, went to school in Sydney, he's worked for big startups, he's worked for established companies like Microsoft, he's been part of digital transformation in a number of different companies, including the wreckage of Channel 9 in Australia, uh, and now is the major domo, the guy who runs iFlix, which we're going to talk about for starters. So Mark, tell us about iFlix. So let me start with iFlix, and I'll come back and ask David about ATT and Time Warner, one of the biggest mergers the world has ever seen, because we think we're going through a very fundamental transformation of, of three very big things. The way people consume entertainment, the way entertainment is distributed, and then the entire telecommunications world and how that's merging. So start with a thought experiment and say, when was the last time you rushed home from Web Summit on Tuesday night to get the next episode of your favorite show? And most of us in the room would say it has been years since that's happened. And yet there's about 150 to $200 billion worth of companies across the world that are built 
on telling you what you can watch and when you can watch it. It's the first big theme. Second big theme is that in the next 15 years, there's two and a half to three billion people who join the middle class, and none of them are in North America, and none of them are in Western Europe. The emerging markets start to dominate the middle class over the next 10 to 15 years, and every single one of them, as they have enough disposable income, they either buy a moped or they buy a phone. And the phone that they hold in their hands has the same computing power as the phone that beat Garry Kasparov in chess in 1997. So we have a supercomputer in our hands, and the iFlix vision says, how do you bring the world's best content? Because we're now moving into a world of global culture. How do you bring thousands of hours to people on this device, to people who have never had pay TV, who have terrible internet, all for less than the price of a pirated DVD? And so when you think about the transformation that's taking place in media today, um, you also think about the ability to put capital to work and where the opportunities are. Um, and so at Evolution Media, we enjoy this really unique position like uh, Mark was talking about, where we have partners with Creative Artists Agency as well as TPG. So we have a very large capital partner as well as this incredible positioning inside the entertainment and media uh, ecosystem. We're at the vortex of where content and digital meet. So it's an incredible opportunity for us to participate in this growth. And the iFlix story is a perfect example of the, the combination, again, of the access and the opportunity and the ability to make a change. What I love about iFlix is it's a, it's a bit of um, doing well by doing good, where you're actually bringing the ability to be entertained with premium content to a part of the world that wasn't until the very recent past able to actually enjoy that type of content and enjoy it on their phone, enjoy it in a way that um, previously the only way you could access shows like Mr. Robot, which you get exclusively on iFlix, is from a pirated DVD. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of transformation taking place. There's a bit of, hopefully, a degree of cultural impact. Don't want to overplay the, uh, the import of the content that we're bringing, but it's, it's an incredible um, virtuous cycle, I think, that uh, a lot of people in the um, North America, Western Europe, don't really focus on what happens in a part of the world where there's 600 plus million people um, who don't have a lot of the um, options we have when it comes to digital technology and, and especially content. So really what's happened is in some sense obvious. Um, for most of the time when people my age were growing up, there were very limited distribution channels. Uh, in the US you had three networks, you had a few independent stations, you have radio, but basically the distribution channels were very limited and you had what was called broadcasting. Mm. Um, now what we have is narrow casting. There are many, many different kinds of distribution channels, um, and that's leading to an insatiable demand for new content. Um, and, and so as opposed to just the technical side, uh, people in the tower business, people uh, um, making technological advances, uh, that's one interesting area. But the most interesting area, to my way of thinking, is the creative piece of deriving content we didn't have the same kinds of distribution channels. Everybody watched the same thing, and there's huge social results coming from that. One of the reasons, in my view, you have all this fragmentation. We've got a US election tomorrow, which is the most acrimonious one we've ever had. And why is that? Partially, it's because people who had no outlet to yeah. express their views can now do so freely, whether it's a Twitter or a space. Uh, so, We've seen a huge change in people's ability to disseminate ideas, and that's true globally, and it's going to be more. But part of that is the, uh, the insatiable demand for content, and that's where uh, people like iFlix come in, which they're not only a distribution channel, but a controller of content. So it's an interesting, interesting stat we saw recently, which is I consume twice as much television as my parents do, and my children consume twice as much television as I do. And so you do start getting to real constraints on the number of hours in the day. But I have four kids, and they'll sit quite happily with the four of them on a couch, each of them with their own device. Each of them watch something completely different, and they call that family time. And I want to go back to David's point. That, that's an, uh, an amazing point. And the, if you go back to 
seven years ago, eight years ago, there were four buyers of television content. It was basically the broadcast, two premium channels, and that was it. Mm. Today, it's almost unending the opportunity to sell programming. You've got a expansion that's uh, probably over 100 buyers in the U.S. landscape. You have international buyers for product. And then you talk about the social media that David was referring to. You actually have Facebook, Snap, creating original programming. So the idea of what programming and television content is today, I think, is actually morphing into something that we haven't really seen before, which is incredibly empowering and incredibly exciting from where we sit with proximity to creators, proximity to capital, and how to put something together that didn't really exist before. So it's, a, it's, a, an, it's an incredible time, again, to be doing what we're doing. One of the biggest mergers in recent time, AT&T, Time Warner, is betting on this thesis of convergence and disruption of change. What's going to happen? Well, I think you have to, if you're a phone company, you have to be terrified. Uh, for a long time, the phone company in the United States, for a good example, but it's true in Australia and other places, the phone company was a monopoly or a quasi-monopoly and was a license to print money, mm -hmm. uh, and it was the main channel of contact among people. Now, all of a sudden, you, why should anybody pay for phone service in the future? Uh, we're in a transitional period, but you got people, started with people like Skype and so forth. Over time, the phone companies are going to have to live off of data transmission and the use of their pipes uh, as opposed to controlling the uh, situation as, as they have been. So if you're, you're AT&T, uh, you've got a lot of capital, you've got a lot of cash flow, you're in a transitional period, but you're, you ought to be, and I suspect they are, uh, terrified of what uh, happened. That explains the Yahoo deal, explains this merger, it explains what's happened with things like AOL. Um, and the issue I think the government will, will be interested in is, is this notional merger going to benefit consumers or harm them? Um, it's not clear which to me, um, and I don't think it's not clear which to a lot of people, and the stock reaction sort of suggesting that there's some question as to whether it goes through or not, but it's all about who, who is going to get the consumer to pay for what service. Mm. A lot of it has to do with, I think, the political environment as well, and so David, you've seen so many different cycles. What do you think of the political environment we're in now? <laughs> Ask me tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid to, but I hope, I, I, I feel like what happened in the UK, there's this, you can feel a bit of a groundswell in other parts of the world. I think that type of sentiment will impact the Time Warner decision. I think that there is a moment when people are looking not as much for innovation, which I think is not good for, frankly, this audience. And I don't know if, if you feel the, the same, same impact or that same sentiment. I don't know. I mean, what, what happens is uh, capital tends to be backward looking. It's inherently easier to figure out what something right. is worth that's been in business for a while and has an EBITDA and all the rest than it is when somebody comes to you with an idea and says, gee, I have this idea and it's called Skype and here's what I propose to do. Right. Uh, you know, Microsoft thought it was worth $8 billion. The guys who they bought it from thought it was worth one. It's a little, little harder to right. grasp that and the phone companies, which are necessarily backward looking, don't have a clue as to how to value these things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing they know is their position is untenable going forward. It's still tenable today, but it isn't going to be very tenable going forward. You know, I thought, I don't know if we're set up. Are we set up to take questions? Uh, we were, I thought there was an iPad. Um, if there were questions from the audience, we'll figure out a way to do it. Um, I don't. But in, in the meantime, wait, before we do that, I want to pivot. We have um, an incredible audience, thousands of people. We've got founders, entrepreneurs, uh, investors. You know, I think this is a great moment for someone like David Bonnerman and to have an entrepreneur like Mark talk about, David, what do you look for in an entrepreneur? And Mark, what do you look for from a partner, from an investor? Go ahead. When we, when we started LifeLix, we went and saw studios all over the world. We said, we want access to your best content in current US release series. And we want people to be able to download it all to a phone and keep it there, which doesn't exist anywhere out in the world. And we got laughed out of the room 50 times in a row. And then Rick called the presidents of the studios one by one. We went back in and we talked about piracy. Piracy is a long-term social issue. Piracy is a long-term challenge. 
and we now work with 160 studios and every single piece of content can be downloaded. Three weeks ago, I was in Iran. And the question of Iran and an opening society where Western values are starting to spread and there's a passion and a desire with an English-speaking, young, high socioeconomic audience to get access to global content. And there's a real question as a foreign company, how do you get access to that? And there are two people at TPG who currently guide us through that process. And so that's the, that's the short answer. OK. Uh, people in this place are mainly entrepreneurial kind of folks, so they wouldn't be here at all. Uh, but you know what we look for, there's no, no, no pattern. You look for somebody who's passionate about something, who's smart, intelligent, understands, and, and has an idea that you like. And most of the time, you get it wrong. It's the nature of venture capital. It's the nature of new technologies. Uh, nobody predicted uh, the current winners. Uh, um, some guy in a college dorm room thought up what is now Facebook. There's some argument about what guy in the college dorm room. Right. It was but made a movie about it. Nevertheless, um, there weren't a lot of uh, AT&Ts around to throw money at people. It was done by friends and family, and that's why the industry is, is what it is. But I'd just like to, going back to the thing, how many here, how many folks here, please hold up your hand, have a landline? Amazing. Yeah. It's like about six. How that, many of you know that, the number is the other question. Uh, and the third question is how many get anything except solicitations <laughs> uh, on, on your landline? Exactly. <laughs> that tells you all you know, need to know about AT&T and its future. So, I, again, and I, I don't know, we were supposed to have, be able to do questions. I don't know if, if uh, there's an iPad that we were going to have. I don't know if they, that's still part of the program. But if there is, we'd love to be able to entertain questions from the audience. Um, but while we have you, David, uh, and I talked before about, again, the TPG is the uh, largest pure private equity firm in the world. Again, you've invested tens of billions of dollars. You've, um, had this storied career. Um, I'm not going to embarrass you by going backwards and talking about it again. But what, what motivates you? What drives you to continue to expose yourself to entrepreneurs? What is it that keeps you going? Well, what, uh, for me, the most interesting thing is learning new things. You meet many smart young people doing great things. Some will succeed, most will fail, but they're all smart, they're all impassioned, they're all interested. And it's, uh, you know, we can always buy a widget factory and make three times our money, mm. but it's much more interesting to figure out how iFlix is going to take over the African market. Mm. <laughs> well, which is, which is on the docket. So, Mark, why don't you talk about some of the international expansion? And we, um, we think the triple play is changing. We think the mobile carriers become the future of the world. There's a wonderful desire to sit in a mature market like Lisbon or London or San Francisco and look at emerging markets almost like we look at our kids with a little bit of disdain. And you expect them to grow up just like you. Except they don't. They grow up bigger and faster and stronger. And so I often, I often share a slide which compares broadband speeds in two places I, I have. I have a house in Australia where I get 7 megabits a second. I have the office in LA where I get 20 megabits a second. And I have a picture of the Temple of the Reclining Buddha in Bangkok, where a monk will give you a free Wi-Fi pass that you can get 180 megabits a second download. Now, two years ago, you couldn't even get a consistent mobile 3G reception. But Thailand, in the last two years, has leapfrogged most of the UK and most of the US, and all young people under the age of 25. And so giving them a product at a completely low price that actually meets their needs and cares passionately about where they are is what we think about. That, that's a really interesting point because the company, countries that have been technologically challenged are going to leapfrog, are going to leapfrog the existing companies. We see this in Myanmar, Over. which because of the dictatorship had effectively no cell phone, no mobile phone yep. coverage anywhere in the country. We built a tower system. Financially, it's done very well, but what it's done is enabled it to be the fastest growing market in the world. In the world in history. So these things are going to happen, and they're going to throw us off the stage. I know here. they are. Just another minute. Um, this was fun. We could keep going, but we're getting yelled at for being over. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all very much. We'll be back next year. Take care. Yeah.